It's time to start next presentation. Uh, next presentation is presented by the Pastor Rafael Santiago. He is a PhD student at IAS Theological Seminary. And the uh, title of the presentation is Cultural Entry Points for Missions to the uh, Mat Mat Matik Saluk Manobo Tribe in Bukidnon, Philippines. A brief study of the missional approaches to indigenous people groups. So let's welcome Pastor uh, Rafael Santiago. Um, good afternoon, and also to those who are watching, we uh, may forget them, but those who are watching, who might be watching at pag natin webpage, especially my wife is watching now at the Supreme Court. Hi, Kim. Um, so, uh, this is special for me because I'm presenting a paper, which actually I did a paper on when I was in linguistics uh, back in the university. I went to this tribe in 2006 as a linguistic student, and then I went back when I started working for the government under the Commission on the Filipino Language when we did a, uh, the linguistic map of the Philippines. And right now, I, I, I wrote a paper going back to my data and my notes about this tribe, but this time it's not about linguistics, but it's about missions, not even in my area of studies in New Testament. So bear with me, I'm not a missiologist in any way. Cultural approaches for missions to the Matigsalug Manavu. The Philippines has around 178 different ethno-linguistic groups. This means that there are about the same number of cultures in this country. Considering that the country has been quote-unquote Christianized for over four centuries now, we might imagine how the entire Philippines would be won over by this religion. However, the success of Christian missions in the indigenous groups in the country is somewhat limited. Rather than fully accepting the newfound faith, they often adapt elements of the new religion and fuse them with their folk faith, as we have seen in many other uh, belief systems. Nevertheless, the Great Commission remains to be object the objective of Christianity. Jesus said, Matthew 28:19a. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. In other words, nations, or I, I, I like to say ethno-linguistic groups, must be Christ's disciples. Not just audience of Christianity, but Christ's disciples. As followers of Christ, we must penetrate into their culture and into the minds. How are we going to do this? This paper proposes culturally appropriate Christian missions tailored specifically to this Matigsalug Manubu tribe in Bukidnon. The Matigsalug people is part of the larger Manubu tribe in the Bukidnon Davao area in southern Philippines in Mindanao. Uh, this group, Matig Salug, are found near the Salug River, which is now called the Davao River in San Fernando, Bukidnon. In the 2014 count of the National Commission for Indigenous People in the Philippines, there were about 146,500 Manubu Matig Salug members. Majority of the people profess a Catholic faith, and according to the Joshua Project, only 1.5% are Christians, including the Seventh-day Adventists. The endonym, Matig Salug, means people residing near the river. This is not very different from other larger groups in the country, such as the Tagalogs, like myself, whose name literally means the same thing, from the river, Tagailog. This is not surprising because ancient civilizations anywhere in the world usually thrive near a water source. We must create an important cultural cultural decision at this point, which is not to look at the Matigsalu group as essentially lower or different from us. All right, let's go very quickly to the significant features of the culture. One significant, number one, a significant feature of the tribe is their political structure, which is largely chieftain-based. The chieftain chairs the tribal council of elders. The tribal council has almost absolute power and jurisdiction to
to punish or exonerate those accused of crime. Of crimes. For instance, revenge killing is common and actually an accepted form of justice. The parties would come to the tribal council when either of them wants to end the killings. In one occasion, in 2006, I happened to sit and observe. We were allowed to observe at the tribal council of uh, revenge killing. The tribal council decided that the killer should pay one horse and three chickens, which is at that time the amount of 7,000 pesos just to end the revenge killing. This feature of the people's lifestyle is important when we consider principles on revenge, killing, and even reparations, or even the concept of guilt. Number two, the Matigsalug are largely farmers, while a small number are still hunting and gathering or slashing and burning. This primitive Kaingin style of farming renders them semi-nomadic. They move from place to place. And this is a challenge to missionaries as there would be no consistent interaction with the people. This might also be one of the factors why when I went there in 2007, when I went back the following year, the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Sinuda near the highway was turned into a goat pen. And I was so sad because it says Seventh-day Adventist Church, Sinuda, Bukidnon. And then when I peeped inside, there were goats and there were no People. It's just a building that was built two years prior because people move from place to place. They don't stay in one place. Number three, the beliefs of the Matigsalug tribe are largely animistic as are other people groups in the country. They believe in the many invisible spirits that interact for better or for worse with human affairs. And these spirits are neutral beings. There are no bad spirits. There are no good spirits. There are just spirits that sometimes they want to help people and sometimes they just cause annoyances and problems. In other words, the spirits are the gods of their own, doing whatever they wish to do. One notable feature, however, where we can also enter is their concept of the greatest among these spirits. Number four feature, when Christianity it came, the Matigsalug simply adjusted their beliefs, especially in the, spirit, in the spirits, because they still believe that they are around. In one of many of the interviews, even with the local pastor, a Baptist pastor, he shared his own personal encounters with these spirits on a regular basis. And when he invited me on one Sunday at a Baptist church, which is a bamboo makeshift church, one part of the service contains only testimonies of the members about how they encountered certain spirits for that week. One woman, for example, shared how in the previous week, her young son was uh, pushed back and forth by the spirit. It was just being pushed back and forth for no other reason. And then the pastor prayed for her and would scold such spirits and would pray for the angels to help uh, the people scold the spirits. So the syncretism that is present in the tribe's religious affairs is the starting point for missions. In the religious life of the Matigsalug, yes, Jesus is already known or present. However, his role, like that of a pastor, seems to me to be that of a simple shaman instead of a savior who sacrificed himself for us. Now let me go to the cultural entry points, which is the main part of the paper. From the perspective of the indigenous people, the outsiders are either foes or masters. So when you go there, uh, especially when I, I, I'm Tagalog, I can speak a little bit of Cebuano. They can speak Cebuano. It's their regional language, but they have their own language. And they would laugh at me because uh, I would speak in Cebuano slash Tagalog, but they sometimes speak in Cebuano. So they, don't, they, they see you as a friend if you're friendly to them. But if you, especially the Davawenos, they are averted by the Davawenos, the people from Davao, especially Davao City, because they see them as foes, as masters, as land grabbers. So for them, aliens or people outsiders, I mean, are either foes or masters, and they will never be treated equally. This is the danger of doing missions for such groups. However, this is also, I think, a very good starting point for us. For others, this might sound an exploitation, but for the Christian missionary, this is what I think the Bible 
means when, when in 1 Corinthians it says, taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So, for the Matigsalug, the approach begins, this is the first approach that I am proposing, begins with coming to them as people who are neither foes nor friends. We shouldn't come there as, hey, we are your friends. This is instant noodles or sardines or, or whatever. Nor are we their enemies. Like, we will grab their lands. But the missionaries must bear a certain authority that should be perceived as over and above such dichotomy. Is he my friend? Is he my foe? No, he's beyond that. The missionary should present himself as beyond that, either to the medical help they offer or more so the spiritual authority that they possess. In other words, like the pastor, the approach is to present the missionaries not necessarily as shamans in the traditional sense of the word, but as masters over these spirits or spirit master, I would say. What I mean is, in Hebrews 2, for example, uh, it says, for it is not to angels that God subjected the world to come, and then so on and so forth, that it is not yet time for the man to, to, to get what is crowned to him. But the idea is, yes, we are above these spirits, and we must acknowledge that. That's the proposal. If the missionaries will come and present themselves as essentially on equal footing as the local people, what power do they have over those spirits? The first approach then entails the missionaries to acknowledge these animistic beliefs but redefine them biblically, such as teach, teach them about the controversy between God and Satan, the truth of an absolute good, and the promise of salvation. That's the first Approach. A second cultural approach, I only have three, to doing missions among this tribe is by way of offering innov innovative ways of education. In spite of the many families who are beginning to settle down, there are still a considerable number of semi-nomads in the tribe. The children from this group suffer because they cannot attend a normal school because they have to go from one place to another. And this is also the case when I went to uh, the, uh, the Mangyan tribes, there are seven or six slash seven tribes in the, in the Mindoro area. Uh, the, peop the, the children cannot go to normal schools. Even when the, the NCIP established a school for indigenous children, no one goes there except for some local children who are actually living in other towns. Uh, the the missions program, aside from the religious goals, must adapt to this lifestyle by creating pedagogical structures that will fit the situation. And what I have in mind here is the example of, I don't know if you remember, um, Peña Florida's rolling school project. Uh, as recognized, he was given the award by United Nations where he packaged an entire school into a single cart that he pushes along with the street. Actually, that's here in Cavite, as I remember, somewhere in Bacoor. Or he's from Cavite, but he's doing it in Manila. But it's a cart of, it's a classroom cart where he pushes it along with the school children and he teaches them the curriculum that should have been taught to them if they are in grade four, grade five, or whatnot. For the Christian missions, I was thinking instead of asking the children to come to a particular place, such as our mission houses, I've been to the uh, Philippine Frontiers Missions area with Dr. Dizon in Zambales, and they have a missions place. They have a structure, a building, a mission house, and they have children coming there and teaching them. That's good for that group because they're not nomadic. But my suggestion here is this. Instead of asking the children to come to a particular place like a mission house for instructions, the missionaries may be a must adopt a semi-nomadic lifestyle of evangelism. And John 21 is essentially the same because Jesus himself walked and joined the disciples. They didn't, they, he didn't call them while they were doing their economic activity, fishing. I propose then that it is not enough to simply establish houses or mission schools, but to actually craft a nomadic evangelistic style or mobile missionary centers on a cart, on a bicycle, or even on a backpack if it's not possible. 
The idea is not to disrupt the socio-economic life or activities of the Matigsalog group, but to encapsulate it with the gospel. The third approach is by far the largest. It's by way of responding to a major challenge that the tribe faces, but not only this tribe, but many indigenous tribes. And what is that? Ancestral homelands. Every time an intrusion happens in an area occupied by the Manuvu, they would wage what they tribal wars, which, which they call Pangayao. But because they don't have the education and technological advancement in weaponry, they usually end up being victims and being victims of land grabbing, especially by those who are not from the area, by people like myself, from the Tagalogs and the Visayas. They would sometimes turn to the government, but often to no avail. Now, this challenge is admittedly bigger than we can ever dream to address. Nevertheless, at least I say we must recognize it. The problem of ancestral lands for indigenous people, not just in Mindanao, is a national problem. However, as missionaries bearing authority, as I uh, suggest, spiritual, moral, social, and otherwise, we must at least give them our take on their struggles, these particular struggles, without necessarily being political activists for them. This might even be an entry point into the idea of the real promised land. And I think this is a perfect analogy for a displaced people searching for a promised land, for a home. As to the possible and practical solution, our hands and feet are tied unless the church can buy the entire ancestral land for them. But for the sake of the Christian standards that we bear, we must present ourselves as being always, always, and unequivocally in the side of justice, Micah 6 8. In my university, back in undergrad, there is a group called the League of Filipino Students. They are actually a group of the CPP, Communist Party of the Philippines. And one of the things that they do is they would send students, I was never a part of them, but they would send students to the field for what they call immersion. And in this immersion, they would educate the people about their rights, legal and otherwise, and enfranchise them by giving them livelihood, teaching them some um, um, agricultural um, innovations and technology. What I'm proposing is, why shouldn't we do the same? I'm not advocating for political activism. I'm just saying we as missionaries should also be present in their socio-political problems and not shy away from it. Therefore, missions in the Matigsalug must be characterized both by the desire of the missionaries to share Christ, to, the, to disciple the people, and also to empower them socially, pedagogically, as I mentioned, politically, against the total hegemony of the rest of the country, or even the rest of Mindanao. What we achieve, when we achieve this, we may be able to engage the community into a deeper dialogue of philosophical interest, and we may even elevate their level of interest in this life and the life to come. So let me just recap my three proposals as a way of conclusion. When culture is changing, language, beliefs, technology, mission, Christian missionaries should not romanticize what's left in the culture. The cultural entry points proposed to be appropriate for the Matigsalig people serve this purpose and maybe even for other ethno-linguistic groups. First, by presenting ourselves as having spiritual authority over the spirits that they encounter daily, we can provide hope in elevating their lives and in terms of their health, social affairs, and spiritual matters. Second, by adapting to their socio-economic structure, the missionaries will be able to plant the seed of the gospel, especially to the impressionable young minds who will conduct the affairs of the tribe in the future. And finally, our non-politicalness with regards to relevant sociopolitical issues must not hinder us to seek and to teach justice for the people we serve. With these approaches in place, other related and more detailed approaches can be derived. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Pastor Marfeo. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. No questions? Ah, here. Okay. Uh, actually, this is not a question, but uh, I was uh, reminded of, uh, of this uh, kind of ministry that you are sharing. Like, uh, for example, we have people, uh, for example, th those people who are building, uh, those people who are in the construction sites, they are there, probably sometimes they are there for three to, to six months. And if we can have like bringing, instead of bringing them to our church, let's bring the people, like for example, a singing group like uh, like the one we have here, and then bring a, a, a preacher, and then bring them there. Uh, build, build, build. So building lives of the builders. Yeah. So this is an idea that some are also doing. But I think uh, I, I like your idea of you know instead of us bringing them to our church, why uh, we need to go to them to reach them. Yeah. Yeah. I think sometimes we 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 disrupt our system because as we know, the New Testament, right? It's a centrifugal system where we come from the center, Jesus Christ, into the out, outskirts. And sometimes we feel that when we're already in the place, like the PFM or the 1000 Missionary, well, we have already been sent out. But from that place, sometimes we become centripetal. So yes, we were centrifugal because we were sent out from Manila. And then when we come to the place in Bukidnon, for example, we build a church, and we expect the people to come to us, centripetal. And so my suggestion is for mission works in, in indigenous people is to fully capture what uh, Pastor is saying, that the centrifugal um, model of um, mission for evangelists. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Uh, this is not a question. I come from Bukidnon, and so far, as far as I know, this is what MVC is doing. We are doing, we are sending students uh, every year to the different, we have different mission schools. We have entered all, almost all the tribes in and around Bukidnon, and in fact, uh, many parts of Mindanao as of now. And I think we have been doing what you are saying, that we need to be among the people, because ever since 1976, I think that's what they are doing already. And in fact, we have already established some schools in some tribes in Manu Manubo tribes in Bukidnon, and also in Agusan, and also in Cotabato. And as far as number three, coming from Bukidnon just very recently, the problem now is we have lands uh, already owned by Lumads or Visayas and other tribes. The problem now is because of the ancestral land law, the, actually the Manobos are trying to reoccupy these lands. And once they enter the lands, uh, it's very difficult to drive them out again. That is why uh, MVC, before I left, really, they really were very vigilant because this is what they do. They really occupy during the night, and in the morning, you will just see them sprouting like mushrooms. So uh, for number three, I think the government law against the ancestral land is very strong. So as of now, we don't really have, I, 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 can, see, I can say that it's not really a problem. Uh, thank you very much, Pastor. Is there room for more? Uh, one more. I uh, I really like those uh, approaches. Uh, we in UTS we support the Lumads because I think that was last year that when the Lumads came to Manila, then registered their demands to the government for that for their land because according to them land the forests are their hospital 
and the forests are the schools. Have you heard about the Save Our School? The schools in Mindanao, the tribal school in Mindanao, which is burned by the military. Have you heard about that? Oh, so, well, I, I've been to a study about indigenous belief, so I didn't call that their belief as animistic belief for respect. Maybe it can help you in your mission if you consider their belief as a system. system. Maybe we can call it indigenous belief system. They have their own system of belief, and they are not animistic, actually. And it can be helpful, when we, especially now that uh, we are uh, facing the, the issue of uh, ecological destruction. Okay, thank you very much, sir. And thank you also, Pastor, for the, for, 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 uh, the update. Uh, but as I was uh, like contemplating on this, Yes, it's about the Matiksalig Madhuvu, but I'm all, I was also thinking about the other indigenous tribes in the Philippines. And thank you also, uh, Pastor, for, for giving us an update about that. Uh, uh, excuse me for my use of the word animism. I was just trying to, you know, give a term for the beliefs in their, uh, for their beliefs in the spirit. But maybe you're right. It's also time, even for us in the academe, to be sensitive linguistically um, in, in, in our labels. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's give hands to Pastor Rafael.